And before the coffee break, we have uh, one more discussion going on. So I'd like to ask uh, Martin Grensey from the Slovakian University of Technology to come and join us. Okay, perfect. Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Martin, like pretty much every other guy in Slovakia, especially born in 1980s. Uh, in the last section, we had Tomas. You might have met some other people from Slovakia with other names. They were born in different decades, okay? That's the reason here. I'm not saying they are younger. And I'm from the Slovak University of Technology, and I have a very important role here. I make sure the gender balance is preserved. You might have noticed I am the only moderator who does not have long hair. So that's pretty much all I do here and that's why I'm here. But there are a bit more important people in this session, not me. And uh, you have noticed it's raining outside, so even the last session the discussion was more about issues and these gloomy things. I hope right now we will bring a bit more optimism because at least we have two smiling faces and very, very actually active members of the community. And we'll be talking about a bit, uh, let me, let's say non-mainstream topics. Uh, because when I say Horizon Europe, people usually think about the second pillar. That's where the vast majority of the projects are. So we're now going to talk about the third pillar and some other exotic stuff. So first of all, uh, let me invite Mr. Luke in Corvaja. Uh, a strategy officer from the European Institute of Innovation and Technology here, and he will obviously tell us something about the EIT. So, Luke, the floor is yours, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, first and foremost, uh, good morning, everybody. I recognize that I stand between you and your coffee break, and that the clock behind me is running an hour late, so uh, we're not doing all that well. Um, but I'll try to be as, um, um, as efficient as possible. It is really um, a great privilege for me to be here to present to you uh, the EIT. So uh, I think the first question which many of you are asking is, what's that, right? So the EIT, or the uh, European Institute of Innovation Technology, is a uh, independent body of the European Union, which was established in 2008 and actually based here in Budapest, about 500 meters from where we stand uh, now. Our one and only mission is that of boosting Europe's capacity to innovate and through that to therefore create uh, jobs, to create smart and sustainable economic growth and ensure Europe's competitiveness globally while also um, improving the quality of life of our citizens. So how do we actually um, create innovation in Europe? Well, we build long-term dynamic uh, European partnerships, European ecosystems, uh, which integrate the so-called three sides of the knowledge triangle, business, education, and research. These uh, European partnerships, which we call Knowledge and Innovation Communities, or KICS for short, which I will present to you in a moment, each address um, a specific uh, major societal challenge which is facing Europe and the world today. As Martin mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, we are an integral part of Horizon Europe and stand as part of the third pillar, um, closely working with the European Innovation Council and European Ecosystems Program. So to move on and to present our kicks, we have eight kicks, as I mentioned, each of which is working on a specific uh, societal challenge. How do these differ from other European partnerships? Well, the key difference is that these are uh, independent legal entities. They are independent in how they operate. The EIT truly implements the Innovator Knows Best principle meaning that the EIT provides strategic direction, but it is the kicks themselves, as we call them for short, which actually decide how best to implement uh, and uh, achieve those objectives, those goals, in line with their own um, um, 
specificities, right? So we currently have eight kicks with another kick in the area of culture and creative industries, which was mentioned as a key priority in most um, research and innovation, smart specialization strategies a few minutes ago, joining us in um, this year. Actually, we believe that by June we should be able to, to launch this and another kick in the area of water to join us um, later in 2026. So I mentioned that the kicks are free in terms of the areas or the activities they implement, and that is absolutely true. However, these activities can be um, uh, gathered in three pillars. The first is education, entrepreneurship education to be precise. Uh, our flagship initiative under these would be EIT labeled masters and doctoral programs where students receive both the technical training they need but also the entrepreneur entrepreneurial training and entrepreneurial skills uh, they would need in order to be able to identify ideas and turn those ideas into uh, products and services um, and also allow them to start their own company. This is precisely what we want them to do. Secondly, are our business creation and business acceleration activities whereby we support um, pre-accelerator also from pre-accelerator to, to scale-ups in order to help them grow, to help them achieve uh, their dreams, in order to help um, turn um, their ideas into commercial, commercial products and services, which in turn would, of course, improve the quality of life of citizens, and as these companies grow, will also lead to jobs and uh, economic growth. The last is innovation-driven research projects. I should highlight that the EIT is not a research funding organization. There are other tools under uh, Horizon Europe which do this better. But what we do is the close to market activities whereby we help turn research results, as I mentioned, into commercial products and services. Now, apart from that, there are two other horizontal um, activities. Well, um, Dr. Shabo here mentioned previously the innovation divide which exists in Europe. And we have a specific scheme which we call the Re Regional Innovation Scheme, specifically targeting that. So this is a top-up support scheme under the EIT, whereby we support those countries and territories in Europe considered to be modest and moderate innovators. On the right hand side you can see in green the countries which are um, eligible for that, and the dots are offices which the EIT kicks have established there in order to reach out and engage with the local innovation ecosystems. We currently have around 90 such EIT risk hubs, making us maybe the most well-represented European uh, Union instrument funded under Horizon Europe uh, present on the ground today. So what do we do through the EIT risk? Well, first and foremost, we boost innovation capacity, either through um, concrete um, activities aimed at improving the quality of uh, the innovation ecosystem, but also through integrating the knowledge triangle on the ground. Right? That's what we do best, and that's what we try to replicate elsewhere. Secondly, we try to widen participation. So we make sure that through the scheme, we serve as a gateway to get more participants from these uh, eligible countries to participate with us and therefore spread excellence and widen participation. We also aim to establish very close synergies with smart specialization strategies. Our aim is to do this on a place-based approach, so not to have uh, a one-size-fits-all approach, but rather a place-based approach which is driven by our hubs and also to try and establish synergies in terms of uh, European structure and investment funds, but also under the instrument for pre-accession assistance. I have, to, I have to mention here that the uh, money allocated to the European, uh, rather the EIT Regional Innovation Scheme is significant. Approximately 450 million euros will be dedicated only to these countries, uh, over and above um, other support for the years uh, 2021, 2027. I should highlight that for now three Western Balkan countries um, uh, only are eligible, Serbia, Montenegro and uh, North Macedonia with other countries, hopefully including Bosnia and Herzegovina, joining in the next years. The other uh, horizontal activity which we implement is a tool to support uh, universities in building their own entrepreneurship uh, capabilities 
and also their innov innovativeness. But additionally, the scheme helps to um, support universities in teaching innovation, in teaching entrepreneurship. We have had two calls so far, with the last closing a short while ago. Uh, we will be dedicating significant funding uh, to this instrument, which we, through which we aim to support approximately 700 universities across Europe, uh, with a particular focus on those areas which are not so well integrated into our network. Uh, so that includes, of course, the Western Balkans and the V4 countries over the next years. I encourage you to uh, visit the dedicated website we have. I've included the link there so that you can understand more. Okay, so I'll skim through what we have achieved so far. So I mentioned that the EIT has actual presence on the ground everywhere in Europe, in every single EU member state and also beyond, uh, including in the Western Balkans, Turkey and so on. Um, we aim to widen this, so to increase this even further, but also to try and integrate it, meaning to make it even more easy, even easier for innovators on the ground to be able to access what we do locally. And this local access is something I'll delve into in a moment. We are now Europe's largest innovation ecosystem. Therefore, we have a budget of about three billion euros to spend over seven years, but funding is not really what makes us so unique. It is this network of uh, well over 2,900 partners which makes us um, um, a, a unique instrument within, within Horizon Europe and therefore makes us pretty strong and, and, and well placed in order to support um, those countries and regions in Europe where um, a disjointness from that network still exists. We're particularly proud of our ability to um, create and scale up um, ventures. We've, we've, we've done this with over 3,800 so far, and they have in turn um, raised over 4 billion euros today. So if you had to look into how much the EIT has invested in those ventures and how much they've uh, brought back to, to the market, it's about 1 to 17 euros, which I think is pretty unique, pretty exceptional. There are other figures there in terms of our graduates, jobs, and new products and services on the market. Um, um, we're also pretty proud of having created so far four unicorns, including one sword uh, in Portugal, which is one of those countries and regions in Europe which is considered to be modest or moderate innovator, and we are very confident that this number is continue, will continue to increase. Of course, unicorns on, them, on their own don't say anything, but we believe it is a very clear indicator that we are investing in the right people and bringing uh, the right products and services to the market. Now, I want to talk a bit about what we've done uh, or what we're doing currently in the V4 and also in the, Western, in the Western Balkans, of course. But I just want to highlight that we are very well uh, embedded in the, in the V4 countries with over 133 million euros going to the region um, between 2014 and 2020. So that's the previous EU programming period. We also have over 400 partners here working directly with us on innovation projects and we have supported over 300 ventures. Now this is not a great figure in the sense that we have supported 300 ventures but together they have raised only 27 million euros. It may sound like a lot but we feel that that is below the potential and that's something we'll be working on very significantly over the next years. Our on-the-ground presence is also extremely strong, apart from having the EIT headquarters here in the V4 region, we have seven co-location centers. These are major kick offices. Uh, one EIT community hub also based here, where all the kicks work together in one single office, and also 21 different EIT risk hubs. I think this shows the commitment of the EIT community to the Western Balkan, uh, sorry, to the V4 region and uh, how we aim to continue to do more here. We have also a significant number of success stories. I've listed some here, but there are many, many more. Um, the picture in the Western Balkans is, of course, not so rosy uh, in the sense that the amount of money going there still remains very clearly below potential and uh, the level of participation is also uh, not where we want it to be. But um, 
we have committed ourselves to make uh, increasing our engagement with the Western Balkans, as Sinitza mentioned actually previously, a key priority for the EIT over the next years. We already have a presence on the ground there, but we will aim to increase this significantly over the next years, making sure that we at least have one EIT risk hub in each um, um, EIT risk avail uh, eligible uh, country in the Western Balkans and beyond over the next Yes, we'll be using the EIT RIS as a key tool to try and bring more Western Balkan countries and more um, Western Balkan participants into the fold, into the EIT community. And we will, of course, also be placing a particular focus on the Western Balkans when it comes to our uh, tool to support higher education initiatives. But we also have a dedicated project where all EIT kicks are working together in order to engage more and better in the Western Balkans to try and engage also with policymakers, with many of you around here, to try and ensure that what we do is in line with your needs. And we have heard very loud and clear um, your call, um, your concern about brain drain. And this is something the EIT works very, very, very carefully on. Uh, the fact that we have such a strong network allows us to ensure that we give support to Western Balkans in Western Balkan innovators wherever they are, in their own home country, uh, without the need for them to move. Our network is so vast that through it they can find all the support they need locally. Um, and this is something we wish to ensure we can spread further and bring more to, lo to local innovators. Now, I'm coming to the end of my presentation, but I want to talk about what's in it for you specifically. So whoever you are, whether you're a business, an entrepreneur, public authority, a university, a student or researcher, there is something we can help you with. And how, basically, what can you do? So you can either become a partner, so if you're a big university and you're key, keen on joining one of our kicks as a partner, you can do so. Information on how to become a partner is available on each of the EIT Kick websites. There is a fee, um, but that fee gives you access, of course, uh, to a lot of uh, benefits. You can collaborate with us. There are various ways of doing so. If you're interested in any of the teams I mentioned today, please do reach out um, to the contact points, your national contact points, uh, locally or even to me, and I'll be more than happy to support you. And of course, you can participate in one of the various activities under the three pillars I mentioned uh, previously. Um, I've included here exactly how to do this step by step. So you can go on our website, you can check what our kicks do, you can check what they offer, you can check what uh, the value of each of the different uh, ways to collaborate with us can do for you, and then please do reach out to your national contact points which you have on the ground and I've also included the link here. That's it from me. On the website, on our website, uh, eit.europa.eu, we have an opportunities page. All the opportunities for you to participate with us, to work with us, to gain funding from us or anything like that will be printed and published there. So uh, I very much hope that uh, we will see more of you in the EIT community over the next years, and I apologize for the length of my presentation. Thank you very much, Luke, for presenting EIT to us. I think I'm right if I say the vast majority of us have heard about uh, EIT before. Probably not too many of us have a hands-on experience. So if I could compare it, the EIT is like the Maldives of the grants. But there is something even more exotic, and those would be cascading funds. So that's like the French Polynesia or Tahiti of the grants that even less people heard about, and probably not too many have experienced. So who has heard about cascading funds before? Okay, one, two, three, four, five. The funny thing is the presenter's hand is not up. <laughs> okay, so ladies and gentlemen, this topic will be presented by one of the most popular NCPs in Europe, Maria Sholas-Pasic. minutes or less uh, okay uh, good uh, good afternoon uh, from my side as well uh, 
as uh, my colleague uh, announced me. My name is Maria Sholas Pasic. I am RMI on the first place and uh, currently a national contact point for a financial and legal issue in Serbia. Anyway, uh, my topic for today is about the cascading funds and additional funds we are, which are available to us. As one of the previous speaker from uh, Mr. Maric from uh, regional council mentioned, money is all around. Uh, and uh, because of that, I want to present something which is not so exactly how Horizon Europe and this big uh, programs, but I think that can be a very useful for people from widening countries and uh, probably people from uh, Visegrad funds. Uh, as some of you know what cascading means, uh, it also is known in financial support to third parties as a mechanism of European Commission uh, to distribute pu uh, public funds in order to create new SMEs, new jobs, uh, and the middle cup of companies in adoption or development of digital innovation. Uh, under this scheme, uh, grant, granted EU projects are requested to distribute to third parties a beneficiary uh, issuing open calls. Uh, this mechanism must follow the specific rules uh, that are uh, established by Commission and are set up in part key on uh, annexes, general annexes of uh, grant agreement. Uh, the main objective objectives of this uh, financing method is to simplify administration procedure. And then we are. Sim what is means simplification? In this sense, it really means simplification, not complication, as uh, uh, in the horizon, if I can say. But OK, it's my personal. Uh, feeling about these simplification things. Uh, why we, uh, who can apply? Uh, basically, it is for SMEs, it is for these uh, innovation ecosystems, but uh, it is not just for the uh, companies. Uh, allocating financial support to third parties give opportunities for all ongoing Horizon 2020 project to distribute funding uh, and uh, bring more stakeholders in this game. Uh, applying to Opel Call uh, uh, allow first to receive public funds for ongoing, from ongoing project to specific research and innovation activities. Uh, if you don't have experience with you funded, this is a good uh, opportunity for all of you if you are newcomers in, uh, in all these uh, things. And, uh, what it is a main, from my uh, perspective, uh, establish or strengthen connection with leader, leading players. Why it is important? If you want to go in uh, some uh, bigger EU project, you have to know who are the leader players in your field. And uh, this scheme uh, can uh, provide you a lot of support to be aware who they are and have the con direct contact uh, with them for the future, for the future call or participation in the future uh, bigger uh, programs like as Horizon Europe. Uh, what is the main advantages of this uh, scheme? Uh, short application, up to 15 pages, uh, quick review, uh, you will get a decision uh, in next two or three months. Uh, usually, project budget are from 60,000 60, uh, to 300,000 or something like that, but a lot uh, of money if it is your first uh, project. Uh, of course, everything is depends on the call. Uh, approved budget should be spent according to Horizon rules. It means that you will learn a uh, little bit about all these rules. Small consortium, very often they ask only for one company or one company and one research performing organization. Uh, sometimes it is a, a great advantage to have someone uh, from abroad, but uh, very often you can go just on the national level. And uh, project duration is from six until one year. And normally, the implementation of this kind of project is not so hard. Uh, 
if we want, uh, should speak about the topics, uh, these uh, calls uh, cover almost all topics, uh, a broad range of that. Uh, and uh, why, why, after seven years, not so many of you know for this scheme? Uh, it is uh, first uh, because uh, European Commission, uh, using the same mechanism like uh, InfoDays or similar events, but this mechanism, uh, primary uh, promotion for SMEs, but it is not, uh, in the practice it is not true, uh, because they need uh, something innovative, uh, some innovation, uh, something new and fresh, and the company very often ask a research performing organization to help. And the call for proposal are published on, from my opinion, hidden part of this portal, uh, but uh, in each moment, for example, I checked uh, uh, yesterday, uh, you more or less always have uh, about 20 open calls from all these various uh, topics. Uh, and uh, it is some, uh, somehow I think that's a possibility which should be uh, spread in the world, uh, especially in uh, ecosystem, in business, and uh, uh, for startups and other SMEs uh, in your countries. Uh, do you uh, have any questions about these schemes? No? Okay, then I have a question for uh, you. Uh, because I know the Martin give me 15 minutes exactly. Uh, 10, okay, okay, I know. I know because I always do that on parallel session. Uh, I know that. Uh, but um, how many of us are from widening countries? Great. I, okay. Uh, I using this uh, event to uh, discuss a little bit with uh, uh, all of you about this new uh, scheme, uh, possibility which uh, uh, announced before from Commission and nobody understand how it will look like, uh, except it's uh, like hop on hop of uh, buses uh, from uh, capital in Europe. But yeah, this is an, a new facility uh, and this first call uh, just uh, was uh, published. Uh, at this is the mainly for widening country, and it means it's mainly for all of us. Uh, they explain that we can hop on just on the project which uh, are granted uh, from Commission in Pillar 2 or Innovation AIDS uh, Paid Finder program, and the Commission published uh, the pro all ongoing project in which we can hop on. Okay, we are there. Uh, there are a lot of country are widening. Uh, I'm not sure that you are aware that it is uh, uh, more than 30, uh, 20 countries. But what is the main challenge is there? Uh, only one uh, institution from one widening country can hop on on the project. And the uh, main uh, uh, eligibility criteria that that project don't have uh, w any partners for widening country from the beginning on consortium. And if you see the list, a uh, uh, link uh, to the list of eligibility running project already funded, you will find about 12, 30, 15 projects from different topics. Uh, of course, uh, all the rules are same in, as in Horizon. Uh, in this call, you can get from 0 0.2 until 0 0.5 million euros for your activities there. And it can be very nice uh, from the consortium to get extra money and one participant more to work something uh, for that money. And I think that this uh, uh, advantage is uh, for all of us from widening countries. Uh, only uh, research and innovation uh, projects can uh, uh, use this opportunity facility, uh, not uh, cooperation support action projects, etc. Uh, but of course, I'm waiting on uh, on this to to investigate a little bit and try to uh, hop on in the first call because they have uh, in this first call about 20 million euro for this scheme, and only tw 12 projects which can use it. It is not uh, realistic, uh, but um, yeah, that's it. Uh, 20 million up to, okay, never mind. A lot of projects can be financed in this, uh, in this first call, but I have a doubt and I want to change idea with all of you at the end. How to contact the person who, are, who is in charge or who 
who uh, is in charge for this specific project in which we want to hop on. Yes? Uh, but what is the problem when you go on the list? You will have uh, find a short description of the project, of course, and the university which are in charge. And one small uh, button, and you can contact person, uh, project uh, contact, who, who is on for that project, but you cannot find any name anywhere. Yeah. And what then happened? When you send an email, normally you, uh, you did not get a reply on it. Nobody reply on it. But uh, do you have any idea, uh, except to strengthen our networks, uh, how to find someone on some university of Netherlands who is in charge for from one of the projects from this list on the time? Mm -hmm. uh, from that university? Yeah, okay, good. Great. Maybe to the. No, they don't have it because they just uh, granted. I don't know when the project should start. Maybe they have a kickoff or something like that. Yeah. Okay, uh, Lear, any other? Okay, uh, then I can conclude that we should uh, strengthen our network because we cannot find the people.